Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to what is, I think, the second to last talk. So you've, you've endured all the things only to be disappointed by me, and that's okay. Um, my name is Neil Gomp. I'm here to talk to you about multimedia, particularly the madness of multimedia. So a little bit about myself. Uh, if you've not attended one of my earlier talks on this thing, this is a this is new to you, otherwise this is not so much. I do lots of open source stuff in a lot of different places, and the number of titles that winds up being collected as a consequence of that gets pretty long, but uh, still very happy to do all the things so far. With that in mind, we're talking about multimedia and free software. So when it comes to multimedia, what I'm defining this as is audio and video, and maybe also 3D. And when you look at multimedia standards, they tend to be divided broadly into two camps. You're looking at either stuff in PC-oriented or computer-oriented stuff, and largely you can blame the IBM PC Junior for most of it. Um, and then you have the stuff from the TV broadcast side of the industry, Hence, the TV with Sonic on it. PC standards aren't really standards. Most of them are, you know, made from the need to do stuff to look like something you would have on a TV or in an interactive presentation or whatever. Largely born out of necessity and resource constraints in the 80s and 90s. Like if you think of the Sierra Quest, the Sierra games and things like that, where they'd invent their own encoding types or, or ways to be creative with the three voice sound and, and eight bit color and things like that, the dithering techniques and being able to actually represent rich content on an obviously underpowered, not designed for this kind of an environment, you see there's like it, lots of different ways of it being done. At one, like when I was going through understanding this particular topic, I think I counted somewhere between 40 different variants of RLE, which is a particular image encoding style, and just about as many variants of PCM. Between 80 PCM and, and, and quote unquote regular PCM, there was way too many way too many ways to, in, to save audio on, into a file. Or maybe not a file, but on a chip or whatever. But as computers got better and they became closer to what we intended to expect when it came to you know, seeing movies and things like that, um, the way we did things on PCs became more quality driven. Obviously still resource constrained because computers no personal computer could reach the same level as, say, a theater projector in the, uh, at that point in time. Although nowadays things have converged a lot more. But the important part is that they're rarely documented. There's not usually like RFCs or, in, in, or, or specifications or things like that because it's usually done on an ad hoc basis all over the place. And this is the flip side, right? Broadcast media, multimedia standards must be standards in the formal sense, that there's declarations, definitions, there's consulting processes, there's alignment requirements, technical and political thingies that have to be figured out. They're born out of necessity to scale requirements to ad infinitum, and that includes things like being able to take a program uh, in the content sense, like a TV show, and be able to send it to 100 million people across a region and have it be received on their televisions and be represented consistently. I don't know if they've always accomplished that, but that was always the intent. And that means they have to be aggressively documented, often including reference code, and, and in the era of doing digital video and audio, that includes reference source code for those encoding techniques, generally permissively licensed, often encumbered through other mechanisms like intellectual property rights involving software patents and other fun things 
that are always a pain. But that is basically the contrast from, from PC standards because the PC standards often don't require other people to work together and broadcast standards do. And so that's where, that's where things change. But then the two worlds kind of... Did I? I think I have a slide duplicated. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, then they converge on web video, and it's a mixture of both because from the times that web video was starting, it was also around the same time that broadcast standards went from analog to digital. And so they started changing over to using some of the same kind of techniques you would see in a PC world, except they were written down, documented, and able to scale. And so that's why web video is this weird hodgepodge between the two. So you have made up stuff for how to do the data transmission, but you have very well documented stuff of how the images and the audio is encoded. And then you have made up ways for how you link to it to actually receive it, because every, the people are taking the stuff that everyone worked together on and then adding their own weird stuff on top of it. And so that's how you get things like, for example, how YouTube and how Apple TV and how Netflix, they all send video and they're all based on these common core standards for audio and video codecs. But how you get those varies wildly because they decide to do it their own way. Now, nowadays, through under open source underpinning all this, particularly FFmpeg, um, there has been some forced consensus on how some of these things are supposed to work because FFmpeg isn't going to implement 50 billion different ways to receive a video stream if there's at least three or four ways we could make everyone kind of do this. And so, like, you have sort of ad hoc standards development and then formal standards development from that. But then we talk about web video on Linux, and, and this it becomes a very familiar message that a lot of people see as they like maybe YouTube or Twitch and a number of other like Dailymotion or other popular services. And it becomes a familiar refrain because when you look at how web video is done, as I said earlier, it's a mixture of ad hoc and formal standards, which means, as I said earlier, when it comes to the formal broadcast standards, you have these intellectual property rights and they have these things where, well, because they already know someone's going to always pay the cost for this research and development work somewhere, not everyone gets affected or feels it. Well, in the web world, everyone feels all the pain all the time, and so usually that drives everything down to zero because nobody likes pain. Unfortunately, encumbered codecs don't really work for that world. But, you know, uh, one, a couple of things caused a change for that. So when it came to enabling web video, we have to start with WebRTC. So WebRTC, uh, is a standard for doing real-time communication of basically anything. And it was commonly used to do real-time video communication, bidirectional stuff, video conferencing mainly. Well, during the standardization process for WebRTC, there were aggressive arguments on the sides of using royalty-free uh, codecs, free and open stuff, versus standard codecs that are high efficiency and well adopted in the in industry codecs. The compromise is that both are mandatory. VP8 is the, the one, the royalty-free codec that came from Google acquiring onto and releasing all the stuff. And then you have MPEG-4 Part 10, AVC H2, otherwise known as H.264, used for you know, doing the same thing from the, the broadcast side. This was actually a standard that was made you know, a few years prior, but wound up becoming part of updating broadcast TV for digital. It also became part of Blu-ray and a number of other um, formal standard specifications. And they wanted to have the same quality availability, so it got added. 
But because they became quote unquote mandatory to implement in the RFC standard for, um, for WebRTC, Firefox needed a way to ship it. And they couldn't afford to pay the royalties and all that other stuff. But Cisco and Mozilla worked together to figure out a solution. Because Cisco like, has, a, has a solution, I think it's called WebEx, and they wanted it to work everywhere. And so those interests aligned, and they came up with this. Cisco built a codec that was optimized for low complexity, for being able to handle simultaneously video streams going on at the same time for video conferencing, and called it OpenH264. And basically, the, the, the particular details about how the royalties work for it don't matter for the purposes of the presentation, but suffice to say, Cisco, it, Mozilla didn't need to pay anything. And so neither did anyone else as long as they were downloading it from Cisco. So Cisco and Mozilla worked together to extend Cisco's distribution of H.264 um, codec code to every Firefox user. This had to go extend even further because at this, around this time, um, browsers like Opera with the Presto engine, which you know, I don't know if anybody here remembers Opera and the Presto engine, but it was nice. Um, and WebKit both used GStreamer. And GStreamer was obviously wired into ad support for WebRTC and to be able to sort with this use case. So OpenH.264 was extended to them too. And the result was we had, for the first time, uh, an H.264 codec that everyone could use across all the platforms that um, the IP rights were taken care of and nobody really needed to think about it anymore. But again, we haven't quite gotten here. We're, we're still talking about you know, these applications in a cross-platform sense, and this is supposed to be about Linux, right? So we got to the next step of like, well, now Linux distributions need a way to have this stuff. And it was a problem that needed to be solved, and there wasn't a whole lot of people that could do it. But Red Hat wanted this fix too, because for their users, uh, particularly like the Fedora workstation users, they needed a way to be able to do these video conferencing things, and they wanted to be able to watch YouTube videos and Twitch movies and all the streams and whatever. Like, nobody wants to have an experience that's incomplete. So they worked with Cisco to extend this to support it for all the things within Fedora Linux. And on top of that, they did some extra work to make a version of the reference AAC um, encoder library, FDK AAC from Fraunhofer, um, a stripped version that they felt was safe to redistribute to everyone, and it was still compliant for web video. And so those combined with OpenH.264 plus the FDK AAC that's stripped, it became possible to basically watch most web video because that was the common combination of codecs. The various ways that the, the, the video and audio content was delivered to you was already built into the, the, the platform that you were watching. So YouTube has its own way and it would do it in JavaScript to like decode all the stuff in the player. So that part they didn't have to worry about. They just needed to make sure that the browser could read the, the, the actual content that was coming back. Uh, and with that, we were able to have this capability in Fedora. And then last year, they added a stripped FFmpeg so that things that used FFmpeg to do this, because they already had things that were using GStreamer. And Firefox does its own special thing, and that was wired up in there. But there were a lot of things that use FFmpeg, and Fedora didn't have an FFmpeg, and it wasn't considered worth it, worth it to do it until that point. But last year, we now had this large pile of things and a lot of things were using FFmpeg directly that it got added. And importantly, we were able to reuse this stuff to make that work. Sidebar, neat trick. The FFmpeg that is in Fedora is derived from OpenSUSE's excellent packaging of, of, the, of the library. And you know, y'all did a good job and it was made it very easy for us to, to do that in Fedora. And now we turn around to OpenSUSE. Uh, this problem was solved in Fedora, but, uh, but you know, we're here about OpenSUSE. That's, the, that's what we want to hear about, and how did we you know, solve this problem here? Well, we've, there's always been this complaint about the multimedia situation in OpenSUSE as well, just as long as it's been in Fedora, because SUSE, like Red Hat, is very allergic to being sued out of existence. Uh, and, and I don't blame them for that. So about two years ago, there was a request to 
improve the multimedia support, out-of-the-box experience for multimedia. The solution that they had proposed was something along like enable a certain third-party repository that holds a lot of stuff that SUSE can't ship in, uh, and activate it by default when you install the distribution. There is a reason why they don't do that in Fedora, and the reason is exactly the same for why we don't do that in OpenSUSE. So we had to figure out a different way to do this. Um, I brought up that in Fedora we had done all this stuff there, and we looked at, well, let's, let's see if we could bring it over here to the OpenSUSE side. Lubosch reached out to Cisco, Lubosch Kochman, who's not here. He apparently had to leave just before my talk started, which, mm, but okay. Um, but he worked with, uh, to get a contact at Cisco, and we figured out a way to get this put, put together and negotiated for the SUSE distribution. So now we have the same arrangement that Fedora does for having uh, the OpenH.264 codec enabled on all SUSE distributions. So you can technically it's for OpenSUSE Leap and, um, and, and OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, but you can extrapolate that for whatever purposes you would have for any different variant sub-distributions, whatever, like MicroOS or Leap Micro or whatever. It's all going to work on those. And on top of that, I brought over Fedora's FDK AAC and ported it over to OpenSUSE and got that shipped, um, wired in the uh, enablement into the FFmpeg package in OpenSUSE that I had added on top when, I brought it, when we brought it into Fedora, and basically synchronized the two. Uh, Jan Engelhardt, I don't know if, ah, there, you are here. You know, he was so gracious to like take my SR and then said, yep, yeah, now this is also your problem, and now I'm co-maintainer of FFmpeg in both Fedora and OpenSUSE. Uh, so it makes it easier to keep things in sync. I don't know whether I should be gracious and, and accepting of this or worried and possibly going to lose my mind. Maybe it's both. Um, but we now have this, and the result is, yay, we can watch YouTube videos and stuff like that now. Um, I, obviously, a screenshot can't like be motioned that easily. Well, it actually could, but the amount of effort it takes to actually put that into a LibreOffice presentation was actually surprisingly high, and I just sort of gave up and decided I wasn't going to try anymore. So, <laughs> uh, I wanted to have an animated thing in here, but that, that, that apparently is not a thing you could do very easily. <laughs> so, but it works, right? And, and earlier I was, you know, playing things in here, and it was all just out-of-the-box stuff, activated, first install, auto-detect, auto-install the codecs from just the OpenSUSE-supported repos, and there you go. It all, it, it, it just works. Um, so, uh, any questions? Yeah, interestingly, it just works for some of the websites. Yeah, it okay. Work, yeah, it works for YouTube, yes, very well. And here in Germany, I was uh, looking at and it did not work. Yeah. So I still had to install Pac-Man. What, what is the missing part here? Because interestingly, if I download the video from Tagesschau, then it plays nicely with VLC, so it's not a codec stuff. It's something else which mm -hmm, might be missing. So, there, so this kind of gets into the details of how video is actually given to you in the web. Video on the web is delivered to you either one of three ways. The first way is through MPEG Dash, which is a specification for sending video and audio chunked fragments to you in a pseudo adaptive download way where it can, every fragment it measures your bandwidth and tries to give you one that's optimized for your thing. The second way is HLS, which is HTTP live streaming, which was made by Apple. Uh, most websites do one or two. The third, is, the third is HTTP range downloading. So that's when you take a regular, range download, regular HTTP download, and then you do weird crap on the end of the client browser to keep repooling and re every time you do the range download, and when the range stops downloading, then you do a re-request and check again and check again, and then you, you adapt accordingly. All of these are intended to provide a way to make it so you don't notice when internet connectivity goes up and down and stuff like that. Um, sites that don't use any of these three ways to do video uh, tend to actually have a problem because then that means the browser has no direct means of understanding how 
the, um, how the, the encoding and the transport works, and they may be using some other cobbled mechanism. Uh, and in that sense, then that might be the problem that the browser doesn't have a supporting Im implementation of a custom transport mechanism. So, so for example, some Baroque websites will do things like use MPEG2 TS directly transport stream, which is from the DVD standards, to do weird things with H.264 video and AAC audio. Uh, th there are standard specified ways to do this, and then there are non-standard crazy ways to do this. FFmpeg as a library supports all these, but they describe them as different variants, and maybe not all of the variants are enabled. There's also other types of custom transport mechanisms, like I know of one website, I think out in China, that uses Microsoft's adaptive streaming format, ASF, to transport H.264 and AAC um, video and audio streams together. And that also is a special variant that needs to be turned on. Like, when I was going through the enablement for stuff in Fedora, I had to re-audit all of the, the, the different ways that it all worked in, in FFmpeg and turn all of them on individually. Maybe there's a demuxer or a stream protocol or whatever that's missing in ours that isn't missing in the in Pac-Man, the third party repository you mentioned, that where they have that turned on in their build and that's probably something we should just look at and, and make sure we fix. Like oftentimes if you know that the, if you can download the file fully and then it works with the stuff that we have out of the box, then that means that the transport mechanism isn't supported somehow and is not related to the codec itself. Now there's also some good news on this front. There's also Going forward, there's this move towards AV1. YouTube has enabled AV1 for both live and video on demand content. And in theory land, Twitch is supposed to be doing it sometime soon, TM. Maybe, possibly, who knows. Um, they keep saying it, I don't know when it'll happen. Um, but when it does, uh, it'll mean that all this stuff I just talked about doesn't matter anymore because you're using royalty free codecs that are included in everywhere that are very high quality and also have a very restricted subset of transport standards that work. And those restricted subset of transport standards are already included um, in, in the distribution. Um, and some of this stuff around live streaming, like we talked about being able to watch web video, but another aspect of this that's not on the slides because I actually forgot about this until you asked the question, um, is being able to make this content. So another aspect of this is that when you install this stuff on your OpenSUSE system or when it gets activated, you will be able to produce it too. So you could stream out to YouTube and you could stream out to Twitch and whatever. Um, we don't have OBS Studio yet in OpenSUSE uh, in the main repos. However, a couple weekends back I ported over my packaging from Fedora that I made for OBS Studio to OpenSUSE to give it a shot and see whether it works. And it did, so at some point, I might submit it into factory so that people can just click the button, install it, and use it. And that gives you a fully native integrated way to also have the ability to do live streaming out. And so you get to be part of the content creation era that everybody's like talking about and being able to be a YouTuber or whatever. And whether, you, if you want to do that or not, you know, it's up to you, but hey, at least you can now do it, just out of the box. I think that's pretty cool, at least. Um, given the fact that 264 is becoming a bit dated and some of the websites are moving over to 265, um, that's my first question. Any plans to support that? And if I recall correctly, Open264 doesn't support, oh, sorry, OpenH264 doesn't support G GPU offloading. Any plans for that? So, um, good questions. First, I would be very, very reticent to say that um, high efficiency video coding or HEVC, otherwise known as H.265 video, is going to become commonplace anytime soon. The things that I glossed over that we, the, about how IPR works and standards and stuff like that, the reason why in 10 years we haven't seen H.265 show up a whole lot is because of that. The, the mess around H.265 adoption is pretty well known and well written. I will let you Google search it yourself. But suffice it to say, 
the, re the drive towards AV1 instead of H.265 is entirely because of that. Nobody could figure out a consistent, simple, simple pricing model that would allow them to do this. Now, I, my understanding is that some, some sites in Asia do in fact use uh, H.265, but also Asia is a very interesting place with a lot of interesting rules or not rules. So I can't claim to understand what's going on there. Um, but what is coming down the pipeline from the MPEG group is that there are two new codecs. One is called uh, Versatile Video Coding, VVC, otherwise known as H.266. Um, the broadcast industry is super interested in that. And the other one is MPEG-5, which just got standardized last year. And the MPEG-5 has, as part of that class of standards, the first one is Essential Video Coding, or EVC, that was uh, made, I think, by Samsung and a bunch of other people. And that one is, is intentionally designed so that there are variants of it that are able to be used without any of this complexity. And then there are bolt-on structures on top that give you further enhancements and, and features that you can optionally plug in, but there's always this backwards compatible downgrade. For those familiar with how codec uh, evolution works, this is actually very similar to how AAC works. There are actually three, four, five levels of AAC. And web video only uses the first level. Um, which is called AAC-LC or AAC Low Complexity. But there's High Efficiency AAC, HEAAC, there's HEAAC V2, there's AAC ELD, and so on, and XC whatever. There's, they, they make up letters and put them wherever they feel like, uh, but it eventually comes out with a variant on top of the baseline. But the important thing about AAC is that it's all supposed to safely downgrade to the LC version. So you should always be able to play something. The same is going to be true for the MPEG-5 video. And so that's, I think, where you're going to see more of the future of Codex going towards. They've recognized that what happened with H.265 was so much of a problem that every future Codex development keeps it in mind and makes sure there's always a way to ensure it can be adopted. A second question, sorry, before you go ahead. Um, uh, sorry, second question. Isn't GPU offloading? What? Isn't GPU offloading? That was oh, my yeah, the question. Oh, yeah, the GPU offloading. Um, I think that's probably... <sighs> maybe. Somebody would have to contribute it. I mean, I don't think they're not open to the idea, but I don't think anybody's... Like, most of the contributions to OpenH.264 have been around enhancing leveraging CPU features to make it more efficient rather than going to GPU because uh, part of the OpenH.264 design is just supposed to be portable to basically everything um, as part, and GPU offloading is one of the few things that you can't make portable, um, and so they haven't really focused on it. Okay, I mean, you have it in the stationary world, like, um, like what's it called these days, Kodi supports VDA, VDA API yep. decoding right off the box, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so yeah, for VA API and things like that, um, it varies. Uh, I don't have a great answer for you right now when it comes to being able to do GPU offload for that because, again, it goes into the stuff that I actually really don't want to talk about, which is the, the IPR stuff. But the, suffice it to say, sometime in the future, it will not, it'll not be a concern and then we will have it again. But for now, it's just not a thing we can, do, we can have. Uh, <clears throat> two quick questions. Sure. Uh, is it known when the patents uh, that encumber the subset that open it to 264 uh, is uh, implementing will expire? And uh, I didn't understand from the presentation, uh, does Cisco host just like the binaries or is it like does anybody know where those binaries get compiled from? Is there like a source available so that you know, okay, sure, Cisco sure. gives me this binary, but it comes from that source and I can audit that, yeah. that it's actually that. Sure, okay, so I'll answer your second question and then your first, because the second question is very important. Open H.264 is in fact fully open source and we build it on OpenSUSE infrastructure. Um, to satisfy the terms of the agreement that we made with Cisco, we build it, but we cannot publish it. We, well, Lubos. 
downloads it from a private lockdown OBS project, turns it into a zip file, the yes, zip file, sends it over to Cisco, Cisco unpacks it, expands it on their system, then somebody on the Heroes team works, uh, finangles the mirror system infrastructure to generate the repo data and have all of the binaries, uh, all the RPMs fault out to the Cisco server while the metadata is stored on our systems. That's how the distribution works uh, from a technical perspective. But it is fully open source. You are free to get the source RPM. You can download it, take a look at what the, what the heck's been done. Nobody is hiding that. We are working within the confines of how this works. This is also true in Fedora, where they do exactly the same arrangement. The arrangement actually came from how it's done in Fedora. The Cisco guy was here earlier, and we have talked about fixing this to make this less painful for everyone involved, because having to Remember to tell Lubos to zip up and email the thing so that it can then be uploaded. And then once it is, they confirm that it's been uploaded, that then we regenerate the repos and then do the thing is a whole lot of manual steps that nobody actually wants to do. Um, but it is there and it is open source. Now to your first question about the patents. For H.264, my answer is super simple. The patents are known because the company that administers the licensing of the, the patents documents all of them and lists them, including when they expire. So they themselves will say when they're all gone. Beyond that, I got nothing. <laughs> so. Um, at some point, there may be a determination that a subset of it is available enough that we can include some subset of H.264, just without any issue. Like AAC, H.264 has levels and, and has a way of progressive enhancement, backwards compatibility kind of thing. So maybe in the future, there will be enough unencumbered that we can just kind of ship something just without any of this weird stuff. I don't know when. <laughs> um, generously speaking, the H.264 standard was made in 2003, and the latest revision was in 2021, so you're, we might be waiting a while. <laughs> I, I just don't know. And that's, again, that's all the publicly available information. You can look it up yourself. I have no idea and make no claims about anything. Nobody's opinions or whatever it is just, I don't know. <laughs> um, Somebody wants to look in, if somebody who's important in position of being able to make a decision about this kind of stuff can look into it and, and figure that out, sure. But right now, it's gonna be a while. Uh, any other questions? Okay then. Well, thank you to, to, for listening to me blather about multimedia stuff. I guess. Thank you.